They buried me in the water and I came, I knew. Ha <laughs> ha! Now I'm baptized in blue. I'm a fighter, I'm a winner, never quit. I refuse to lose. I got heart and I got crazy. I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue. I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue. I'm a fighter. What's up, Sheepdog? Welcome to the Changing the Culture podcast. That was my boy at One Time Music. Go look him up on all the socials, Instagram. You can go find all of his music. That song is called Baptized in Blue. You're going to be able to listen to that at the end of this podcast episode. I hope you enjoy this episode and I hope you enjoy One Time's music. He's a fellow police officer. He's the man. I love this guy. Go listen to his shit. Kristen, dispatcher Kristen, as known on Instagram. So excited to have you on the podcast. Can you please tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hi. Yeah, so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I have been, well, I'll, I will be a dispatcher for 21 years in October. Um, my husband is a corporal SWAT officer at the same department. So we, for the most part, we've been carpooling to and from work. Oh my um, goodness. I come from a law enforcement family. And I have uh, three girls. One actually graduated this last uh, COVID senior year. And then I have two little ones that actually we are fortunate enough that our school is going to be in class. So they start on Wednesday. So I'm really excited to quote unquote have some normalcy back together again. Yeah. Kristen, you do not look like you could even be a dispatcher for 21 years. What? Thank you. (laughs) You look amazing. Like, most people I know in law enforcement and nobody get offended by this, but like t- by year 20, they're looking pretty like, it's not good. So what, how, tell me about what you do. Like, tell me about like your self care, your mindset. I want to hear all about it. Yeah. I think like I started doing a little bit of, um, self help and self exploration a few years ago. And I think that really, really helped. Um, I was in like a really bad spot. Maybe you could say, yeah, about eight ish years ago or so. And, um, I just fell into like the fitness world. So I was doing that for quite some time, just changing my eating habits and eating healthier. And that kind of led me down the road to mental health. And I really started working on that. Um, just reading different books and, um, not hanging out so much with um, law enforcement, just because I didn't want to eat, live and breathe what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I also aligned myself with with another family that were able to do um, family hangouts and vacations and camping as well. And, you know, we have the law enforcement common background, but when we're out as a family, we're just people out as a family enjoying and we unplug. And um, on top of that, um, I really went out in search of like masterminds, kind of like what you have. Just to, but outside, again, outside of law enforcement, just to remind myself that there are so many more amazing people in the world. We just unfortunately deal with the ugly all the time. And so I needed that reminder that there are good people out there. We do have support out there. Um, So that's really helped. And it's just continuously opened doors to other like mental health and wellness and stuff. So it's just, it's been great. So I think just having that and learning how to cope and adjust with things is it's made a huge difference. I love how you are, we're so proactive about it. Um, and how you're continuing to be proactive about it. It's very easy for us to not be right. Like we Mm -hmm. can all say we can fall into that trap of I'm comfortable. I'm Mm -hmm. comfortable talking to Sally, Tom and Jane, but you know, they don't make us better. And sometimes they bring us down. So like, good on you. Amazing. Now, could you tell us like when you, can you tell us a little bit about your hard time, like eight years ago, like what happened? Um, so my hard time eight years ago, I was, well, maybe nine ish years ago, I was, um, pregnant with my third child and my father was chief of police there. And so um, it was also, I think, around like the layoff time when we were having a really hard time when the economy kind of tanked. And um, there was uh, another dispatcher I was having severe issues with. And so I was in like an I, a massive IA and 
had like all of these accusations against me. And um, I really think it turned political because um, some of the people continued on with that I after my father um, left and um, my name was getting dragged through the mud through um, um, court cases when they were trying to sue my dad they would throw me in there um, and uh, and then yeah it just kind of followed me I had a couple of um, sergeants and lieutenants mostly a lieutenant that was harassing me um, consistently. And of course I go through the chain of command and of course it gets dropped, right? Because he's in that admin spot. Um, I went through our human resources and they were going through some changes too. So the person who was investigating it, she left and then I had to reopen it. And then it just, we had gotten another, um, I guess you would say a head of staff in our admin and he basically told me to drop it. So I did because as you all know, like there's a bunch of blackballing that goes on behind the scenes and it just wasn't worth the fight anymore. I let go of it and eventually that Lieutenant retired anyways. So I just figured, well, it's going to stop. So thankfully wow. it's been on the upswing, but it was going through all of that stuff that I was ready to like, I don't know if anybody watched Mean Girls, but there's like a scene in there <laughs> where like they're sitting across each other from the cafeteria table and she's like, ready to pounce on her and attack her. I was like really at that like bad point. So yeah. luckily I was able to fall into fitness and that was just what I like lived and breathed for such a long time. But how did you, okay, so I gotta be honest. How the hell did you just fall into fi fitness? Because girlfriend, <laughs> when I'm down, the last thing I wanna do is anything to do with fitness. I just wanna stuff my face. So tell me how you did that. Yeah. Um, well, I also because I had during all of that time, right? And then I finally had my daughter and I, ne I wanted to lose the weight because in addition to like being angry at work, I also wasn't happy with my baby weight, which I know a lot of us females kind of go through sometimes. And um, so I just kind of dove into that. And then um, I wanted to get a trainer and my husband had told me, well, if you can lose so much weight, then I'll buy you a trainer. And I'm one of those, I'm like, oh, you're telling me I can't do it and I have to wait. All right, just watch me. So I did and I got a trainer and then I just really fell in love with it. And I think it just distracted me so much from like, because I was putting money into this program. Mm -hmm. And so if you put like skin in the game, yes. it makes you more like committed to it. Yeah. So for me, like that's all it was. So when I was at work, I just like, ate for fuel and I wouldn't like binge eat on all the crap that gets left in dispatch and like any anger or frustrations, I took it out in the gym. Mm -hmm. So that's what really like helped me get through. And then it just kind of evolved from there, the fitness lifestyle. So tell me about that because when I first met you online, which was years ago, like you were doing a lot of fitness stuff. So can you like, did you do any shows? Yeah, I did. I think about five shows. Holy cow. So I did um, an NPC show um, and it was for bikini and um, I didn't really like all the poses that they had. So if anybody is like not, <laughs> not aware of um, fitness shows, um, the NPC, you're on a, you're on a stage, like a theater stage and the judges sit below you. And there is some like turnaround backside poses that are really like, just not very complimentative to females, especially being a married female, like bending over and showing the whole world everything. Yeah, yeah. So um, I left that federation and I went to another one called WBFF. And it was a lot more, um, I, get, I don't know, I just, I think it was a lot more classy. And if you bent over like you did in the NPC, you got docked points because nobody needs to see any of that. Like you don't need to see anything like that to see your muscle definition. What's yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> your hamstrings are going to pop if you did it the right way. You don't need to bend over. Yeah. So, um, and then, yeah. And on top of that, it was like back in, you know, everybody wanted Victoria's secret rings and, you know, stuff like that. So that's what I got to do. I got to wear like a really pretty gown for the second part of coming out or like really pretty, like angel wings coming out after that. And that's cool. So, uh, yeah. So I finished, I, my goal was to like finish first and that's what happened. I finished first and I was like, okay, on to the next thing. So good for you. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. So 
Okay, so let me ask you this. So you're a dispatcher and you're around a lot of overweight, unhappy, grumpy people because <laughs> it's totally judgmental, but I got to be honest with you. Like I just haven't met a ton of like dispatchers that I worked with that were like, I know there's a few anomalies, but they're just, it's a very certain kind of person and dispatch is a very hard place to work. I would say, do you agree? Mm-hmm. Now, how did, how did that go for you? Cause here you are eating like carrots and chicken and broccoli and like, they're all like, <sighs> Like, was it, were they like that to you? (laughs) A little bit. I think because, you know, just, I think in general with law enforcement, we don't like a lot of change anyway. Right. No, we don't. So, yeah, it's a really stressful job. It's a really stagnant job. We don't get up off our butts very often. So we have to find that motivation and most of us just don't have it or we're just mentally just drained and don't feel like doing anything. And what we do do is we munch and we overeat and we basically either bored eat or stress eat. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of crap for it, maybe like the first year or two. And then it was like, Oh, I'm not even going to ask her for pickups anymore because she's not going to eat with us. And then it kind of led to, Oh, well, what are you eating? And I'd be like, here, why don't you try it? And then they'd like it or like, hey, I'll write you like a fitness program or, hey, I'll help train you or whatever. And slowly but surely they came around. And I think for the most part, at least at my center, um, a lot of the, I think almost all the girls work out or change their eating habits, or at least we're more aware of what we're eating and what we're doing. So it kind of like trickled the fact into a positive thing. But yeah, at first it was kind of hard. Like a lot of people would be like, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And then once I actually saw the results and that I wasn't like just screwing around and it wasn't just a fluke thing, like they took it serious. And I think it kind of helped out at towards the end of it. What what, what do you eat now? Cause like, you're obviously still very much in shape. Like, what do you eat now? Thanks. Um, so I kind of like took a year, year ish off of like working, like being consistent working out. I was just burned out. Um, so I did gain back a lot of weight that I wasn't too happy with, but I'm back on it. Um, I actually have a really cool, it's kind of, I kind of describe it like Subway, but it's called um, Lean Feast. Mm-hmm. And you go there and you pick out your meals. So that's what I've been doing. Kind of meal planning, but not really. They just have like a bunch of different steaks that we can choose from, a bunch of different chicken, turkey. And then you pick like your combination um, veggies and carbs or whatever you want. So every week, me and my husband are doing that now. And then um, I've been working out maybe three-ish days a week or so. So I'm just kind of like taking it as it is, but not as strict and regimented like I used to be. Do you have like a snack in dispatch? Like what, tell me for like the dispatchers listening, right? Like what, like what do you snack on? Like what can they do to help them? Um, I like, um, rugged meats a lot. They're like a first responder company that, um, reached out to me a while ago and I, I really liked it. Um, I like, is it it's just- like, it's like beef jerky, but it's like a healthier oh. beef jerky. Yeah. And it's a, it's a firefighter husband, wife group. And that's what they sell. That is cool. And they have a whole bunch of different flavors. They have like a jalapeno one that like I love. So I'll eat that. Um, I'll have my fruits. I'll bring in an apple or, um, the mandarin oranges are really easy to bring in. Um, I'll have almonds. I like Greek yogurt and I'll put in like, um, granola in there or sometimes berries in there, that kind of thing. I'll have like a protein shake, that kind of stuff. So do you do do seltzer water? Like the bubbly water? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I do that. I really don't drink soda. I don't like no. it. So yeah. I'm usually like water, unsweetened iced tea, coffee. And I, I am a weirdo. I like to drink it black most of the time. I do too. Yeah. And then water. Maybe I'll add in my BCAAs sometimes in it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm pretty boring with what I drink. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. I do. I just think the seltzer like fills my belly. I don't know if you have like, like you know, the bubbly. It just, it yeah. does. It just, I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. I'll have three of those and then see if I'm really that hungry now. <laughs> but I yeah. do do that. <laughs> yeah. um, so tell me like about, I'd love to hear like when you were going through all of that stuff, why didn't you leave your department? Because I'm stubborn. I would have left 
Um, but one, I have to find a job that pays just as well. Um, and two, I was like, if it's me or you, it's going to be you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she ended up making the choice to leave. Oh, wow. And I'm not one of those ones who like, you're going to get the best of me. I'm not going to give you, I'm just stubborn. So I'm like, I am not going to give you the, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is the satisfaction of saying like, oh, we got her fired. Oh, we got rid of her. She couldn't hang. Like, mm, no, no, yeah. you're, I'm not going. I will go when I'm ready to go and it'll be when on my terms kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, it's just, it's interesting, right? Cause a lot of us, like when we go through tough times, it is, it's, you know, we're like, all right, we're leaving, you know, I'm out of here. So I, I guess like your attitudes definitely helped you then that way in that way to, you know, to stay at your, you know, your agency in 20, you said 20 or 21 years and holy 21 October. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, so you've done well. So tell me about like working at the same agency as your husband. Like, how does that go? Um, you know, in the beginning, I guess we're given a little bit of crap, you know, as anybody yeah. gets, but, um, it works out really good. I think because I know not all dispatchers get closure and, you know, especially if they're a large agency and their dispatch center is separate from their officer center. But for us, ours is together and we're a pretty close knit family. So I'm able to always kind of hear what happened at the end of our call kind of thing. So with me and him, um, we're able to talk about work to and from, and uh, it's, it's worked out pretty good. I mean, there have been some scary moments and, you know, I have to just have my dispatcher hat on and do my job and the wife needs to wait until, you know, work's over. So uh, I think we've been doing good so far I and mean, we've been married for 12 years. So we've been doing pretty good. Okay. Yeah. And so you I like it. Did you meet each other at work? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, can you give like, I would love to hear your opinion on advice around that. <clears throat> Because like for like any like dispatchers, right? Because like, here's the deal. And obviously I don't think you were that way, but I'm just going to say that like some women become dispatchers to find a husband. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is true. And yeah. so like, well, I mean, you've obviously seen that. Like I would, I don't know. Like, what do you have to say about that? So, okay. I know that there's a bunch of badge, badge bunnies out there tons of them and they're always going to be there and they're not going to go anywhere. Um, but as far as like inner, like relationships at work, I mean, it's going to happen because sometimes we're there more than we are with our own families or our outside life. So it becomes your life. And then you align yourself with people you have common interests with and that can understand you. So I get that part of it. I think if, if it's the ones that are just getting married, just to say like, Oh, my husband's a cop. Like, I don't really think your marriage is really going to work and you're in everything for the wrong reasons. Mm. So I think they're going to have, if, if that's their main intent, they're going to have some issues. But, mm. um, you know, I think if you do have a relationship at work, at least what's, what I believe has worked for me is when you're at work, my husband's just my a, a coworker. Yeah, that's it. I don't treat him any differently than anybody else. I'll give him whatever call comes his way. I don't avoid giving him calls because I might think that shit hits the fan. Like if you're available, you're going and a story, yeah. you know, and um, I don't show, like I said, I just don't show him any priority over anything because also because again, that goes back to my stubborn way of thinking. Like, I'm not going to give you a reason to complain on me either. Yeah. Smart. So I will do everything by the book you know, and I don't want him to get preferential treatment either. Cause he's going to get crap from the guys too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, another thing I might add too is like, let, the, let them fight their own battles. Like if they're having disagreements with other guys, that's his disagreement with his guys. If I'm having disagreements with guys in the field or other dispatchers, that's my disagreement. You don't get involved. You stay out of it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. That's just how I, I feel. The yeah. Way things should go. No, absolutely. I think that's great. Do you, let me ask you this. What do you, what is one thing that cops do that sets you off while dispatching? <laughs> uh, not listen to the radio. 
Uh, <laughs> continuously ask us questions about the same thing we just literally put out over the radio. <laughs> and oh yeah, ask if we're sending fire to a fire call. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, that's good. Cool. That's good. <laughs> what about the mic? Do you guys ever get the guys that just slap the mic? You're like, you know, you're like whatever, dispatch to 1070 or something and they're it, in their acknowledgement instead of like 10 4 is just a mic click oh yeah we get lots of clicks lots of clicks and i, I mean i guess that's not going away no I'm just like all right whatever <laughs> i i used to let that annoy me and now i'm like whatever i saw you click your mic i know you're listening so i'll just give them a call or whatever and yeah yeah it is what it is so funny mm -hmm. so have you seen like the job like change as far as your job, the dispatching job, have you seen that change over the 20 years? As far as the attitudes or the procedures? Hmm, attitudes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, when I first started, they basically told me to shut up and not speak unless I'm spoken to, um, that you're not here to make friends, you're here to learn first. And as times have changed, it's been a giant, a, gentler, kinder attitude, I guess, which is okay to some extent, but I think we've had a few newer ones that just kind of think like, oh, we're all going to be friends now. And they expect us to be a little bit more lenient with them or they'll do like Snapchat stories or like Instagram stories on their, mm -hmm. on their breaks and stuff. Yeah. Or, you know, I think it's just been a little bit more relaxed with them or they're a little bit more entitled and more sensitive to things mm. so it's kind of hard to find that balance like yes you have to be sensitive and and respectful to what they might be hearing or going through mm -hmm. but at the same time like they're gonna have to have a thick skin and they're gonna have to realize like hey we're in training and this is a serious thing and you can get people killed this isn't a game and some of them just can't like wrap their minds around it i guess what would you say like what would you give for advice for like an incoming dispatchers um because obviously you've gone through a lot of stuff and in 21 years i bet you've got a few calls that have like messed with you huh yeah i've had a few that like come out right away when i think about them yeah Just do you have to, one do you have one you uh, want to share um yeah i guess i could talk yeah i could talk about a few of them one was when i had first started and um i don't know maybe a year or so on and it was a little girl, I think she was around seven-ish, and my best friend in dispatch, her daughter was around that age at that time. Um, and I didn't have any kids at that point. And um, she called just saying that her mom had been stabbed to death in front of her by her dad. Oh. So it was hard, extremely hard to hear that coming from a little one. But um, I really, I really felt a bunch of emotions at that time because then the family would get on and they were in sheer panic and just screaming and yelling and get here. And I couldn't get any information out of them. So I had to ask them to put her back on. And she was like the best uh, caller I've ever had as far as like, she was able to give me, you know, her daddy's name, what he was wearing, what car he was in, that kind of thing. And so it was at the end of my shift. So as soon as that call was over, I had to go home. So oh, I didn't wow. know. And I was still new at the time. I wasn't with my husband or anything like that. So I didn't have anybody to like reach out to and hear what was going on. So as weird things work out, I went home and just turned on the TV and started just kind of vegging and watching the news. And I saw a, a pursuit going through Los Angeles. And this guy was like flagging down news, uh, news people saying like, it wasn't him. He didn't do something wrong, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out the next day I went to work, that was him. And that agency brought him back over. So luckily we got him and that's how I got closure that day. But mm. yeah, it just like, I don't know. That was just a weird one. And um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you know yeah. Kristen, one thing that you bring up and um, I just want to say that as a police officer, I have never really thought about this is the closure that you guys don't get. Right. Cause like as a cop, I'm there. I'm dealing with it. You know, I, I don't, when my shift ends, it doesn't matter if I'm right in the middle of something, I'm dealing with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just think I, I never really thought about that and what that does to you guys. That must be really hard. Yeah. 
Yeah, it kind of is because, I mean, you just kind of, how I describe it to some people is like, you guys get there a lot of the time after the incident occurred. For most yeah. cases, obviously, yeah. not, you know, obviously without the shootings, but for most cases, you guys get there after the crime occurred. And we're the ones hearing it in progress most of the time. Yeah. And so if you were to close your eyes and hear all that or watch like a scary movie and listen to everything that's going on. And then once the officers get there, the movie shuts off. And then you're like, what the heck? What happened? And then that's how we are. And, you know, some of the ones that, like I said, don't have those smaller agencies or those relationships able to reach out. Like you're just left with your thoughts because we finish out the process or the call or whatever else thinking about how it went down, what was going on and how it possibly could have ended. So yeah, I kind of, it sits with you. How, how do you, how do you deal with it? For me, I'm, le I'm lucky enough that I could, um, ask somebody. Um, I can't go into huge detail, but my husband was in a shooting last year and my mind went a thousand different places. What really helped me was, um, actually my friend Aram who does the podcast with me, he was in that shooting as well. So, um, we had carpooled into work and I'm like trying to describe the location to him. And he's like, well, why don't I just take you there? And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. So he took me to the location where the shooting is. And I'm like, okay, well, when so-and-so said this, where were they? When this happened and they said this, where were they? And where was my husband when this happened? And you, and where, where were you standing at? So I could like vis visually put together what was happening on that radio because I could still hear even now crystal clear what happened that day. So mm -hmm. it was nice to like see it and be like, okay, now I understand how everything happened. It's just like a it's that last piece to the puzzle that kind of just helps us like cope yeah. with it. That that's, I'm really, I'm so thankful that you had that opportunity to go through that and get that closure. A lot of dispatchers don't it's, it's yeah. So little empathy that needs to be deployed there. Officers <clears throat> talking to myself, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I never really thought of that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. What do you, what have you found and like, I know that you, like you give some talks and stuff. I know that you do that, right? And like you, like with dispatchers and stuff like that, you're very prominent out online as well. What yeah. have you found? Like, has, have you like dispatchers are asking for, or like, what are you giving them for advice on how to, on how to handle the job mentally? I just feel like, I feel like that compounded with just sitting in front of a computer and just call after call after call. I mean, I just feel like it's going to be a very difficult job. Yeah, so I was um, lucky enough through all of this mental health and fitness thing to um, just happen to fall into some classes about like debriefings and that kind of thing and including dispatchers. So that's one thing a lot, of, a lot of us, like we were talking about, want closure and want that extra piece to that puzzle. So um, even though some of our policies say we should be included in the debriefing, we aren't. I mean, our officers barely even do it now. Um, so I think that's something that we've talked about with other dispatchers that would be extremely helpful. Um, I luckily, as things would have it, went with my partner from work to um, Quantico, Virginia for some resiliency training. And we were supposed to start teaching that throughout the country this year, but you know, COVID came and screwed all that up. So we do a little bit of it on webinars and kind of just talk about being resilient and being where your feet are and acknowledging the issue and dealing with it however you need to in the healthiest of ways. Um, but all of us basically go through the same thing. All calls obviously are different, but we just all go through those stresses. And um, if anything, I just tell them, you know, like some box breathing does wonders while you're sitting at your desk. Stretching does wonders while you're sitting at your desk. Um, doing some walking. If you have a traumatic call and you are able to, to get up and walk around and just take a breath, but in like outside in fresh air, if it's, if you're able to. Mm. So there's like some things we can do, but I know with dispatch, it's so hard because we're always short staffed mm -hmm. or we can't get up because at some departments, it's only one dispatcher that entire shift. Mm -hmm. um, and if like shit hits the fan, we really are the last ones to get asked if we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. And we just like, like I said, with like, even my husband shooting, like the next phone call I answered was some 
person complaining about a legally parked vehicle and my adrenaline's all the way up here and I have to like take it down a notch and be like, okay, this is his big emergency right now and deal with that. And we just keep going for the next, I think I still had six hours on the clock to go around there. Yeah. So it's like, we don't, we don't always get those breaks, but I told them if you're, you know, if you have to wait to the end of your shift and wait to the end of your shift, but you need to go talk to somebody or you need to vent, you need to cry it out, whatever it is. And if they offer you to go to see a psychologist, then go. I did. I did after that shooting because I'm a big advocate for it and I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So I'm like, you know what, let's go check it out and see what it's about. And it was good. It wasn't bad. We went through everything very methodically. Like at first it was just very factual. What happened when I got the call? What did the person say? What did the radio person do? What was happening on the radio? And then we went back through it emotionally. What did you feel when you first got the call? What did you feel when they said X, Y, and Z and so forth? And it was good. It was just a huge brain dump. And it was a ton of stress off my shoulders mm -hmm. and it really helped. There's no shame in like going and seeing somebody for something like that. A hundred percent. I totally agree. Go and see and talk. The more we can talk, the more we can process our stuff, the better we're going to be. Holding it in is the worst thing that we could do. One thing that I wanted to add and just for anybody listening and Kristen, maybe something that you can look up is, um, have you had, ever heard of EFT, emotional freedom technique tapping? Oh, is that where they like touch you while they're, yes, I heard it, but well, it's a kind different of. wording. Uh -huh. Kind of. So you can do it yourself. And the reason I'm thinking of it is dispatchers can, if you have just two minutes and you're sitting there, you don't have to move. So emotional freedom technique, you can look it up. There's a free app. Um, it's called the tapping solution. Um, okay. it's, it, and what it is, and it helps specifically um, with PTSD and anxiety and depression. And um, you, what it does is you tap through seven acupuncture points. So you just literally like, you go like through your points like this and oh. you just tap. Um, if you, if you listen to the podcast, if you go back, um, Nick Ortner came on and he, oh. he's the founder of the tapping solution and he talks about it, but it's just, it's a really, it's a really great tool for first responders. Cause like we can do it all by ourselves. Nobody has to know. And it actually will immediately and it's been scientifically proven, proven it'll immediately um, cut your anxiety in half. And they're using this right now um, to help veterans with their PTSD. So mm -hmm. um, it just might be something good for, you know, a dispatcher just sitting there. Um, Definitely. So Definitely. yeah, yeah. So what, what shift do you work? Do you work overnights? No, I am too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, it, it has worked out for me recently that, um, I have been working weekend day shift for quite some time. Really? So and I like the weekends cause I hate the crowds. So especially down in Southern California, it's like stupid, crazy busy. Um, and then also, uh, my mother-in-law helps us out a lot with the kids. So that's why we're able to work together on the same shift. Um, but she primarily speaks Spanish. So actually she only speaks Spanish. Aww. So um, I can't have her during the weekdays because she can't help my kids with their homework and stuff. And then at the time they were always in sports. So having her going from to and from school and to and from practices in different locations was just too much for her. So we um, tried to keep it simple and we stayed on the weekends. So you work Friday, Saturday, Saturday. Sorry, I work at three twelves. So Friday, yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is my shift. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, I mean, I liked 12s, you know, I work 12s. I like them, but th that can be long, very long. Would, would you yeah. say that's, has this been your favorite shift so far? The 12s? Yeah. What's your I favorite? Love, well, way back in the day, we used to work 313s and I loved it because yeah. um, we currently, well, we're furloughed now. So we would work our 312s and then we'd have a 12 hour payback. So, um, but yeah, when we had the 313s, it was great because I'm like, I just get my three days out of the week and I don't have to go back. Or if I want to take a two-week vacation, I just take off the three days and I got my two weeks. So we're very spoiled in that aspect and I really like it. So going to like 410s or 58s would like drive me up the wall if I had to do that. So, and I think too, like the three days is, is really good because then we get to like come off of our adrenaline pump and all of the stresses and everything. And those four days off are are, I think are really needed. Absolutely. Now, what do you do during your four days off? Like, what do you do for like de like decompression and stuff other than workout? We know you work out. 
Yeah. So um, lately, because of COVID and everything, we've just been hanging out at home. And then we do a lot of camping and stuff. So we'll yep. go either dry camp, which means that there's no hookups. We just take our trailer and park it in the middle of the desert. And we would go um, like dirt bike riding and quadding. Or we'll just go to other um, campgrounds now. And we do a lot of hiking and sightseeing and that kind of thing. So that's basically really all that we've been doing. And then, uh, you know, what every, I'm sure what every other American's been doing and cleaning house and gutting yeah. it and our gardens and backyards and all that stuff. So. That's cool. That's a really great schedule. Cause like you said, that really must give you, you know, give you time to decompress, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Now, so tell me, let's talk a little bit, like, what are you up to online? You have a podcast, you co-host, tell us about that. Yeah. So it's called the No One Strong Podcast. And actually I think it's a year this month that we started. We haven't been the most consistent with it, but, um, it's been going really well. It's with Aram. He's, uh, or better known as 911 Strong on yep. Instagram. And um, we work at the same department and it just kind of happened that while we were carpooling, we're like, dude, we should just start recording these conversations. They would be kind of funny to do. So it just kind of evolved after that. And um, so that's been going pretty well. I mean, like I said, we haven't been um, too consistent with it like yourself, but we've been having a good time with it. We've been able to reach out to a lot of people, which is great. We might have, I can't really say yet, but we have some more progress coming with it, which is really exciting. Um, And then uh, I, me and my partner had put a a small mastermind together for resiliency with a group of girls um, that were in law enforcement. And we just had our final actual in-person meetup. So that was really cool. cool. That must've been so cool. Yeah. So that was really neat to have. Um, and then I just, I had taken a poll, but just because I do get a lot of questions about dispatch and that kind of thing. And so, um, I just today put, made a link to do kind of like an online zoom with a group of dispatchers. And then also if they're kind of shy to do one-on-one, um, meetups through zoom also. So it'll help help some people out there that need help with whatever or venting or just talking or want to compare notes or need solutions, that kind of thing, but all dispatch related. I love that. Thank you for being a leader and helping our dispatchers because honestly, I I do. I mean, I will say, I'm not going to lie. I've had a lot of really rough run-ins with my dispatch. Okay. Cause there's a lot of times where I feel like there's a lot of dispatchers who do not do enough, (laughs) but yeah. But it's been really nice to talk with you and get another side and learn a little bit more um, the emotional side of that. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Mastermind, before we let Kristen go, do we have anything that we want recorded? No. Okay. Kristen, thank you so much. Where can everybody find you? So we know that they can find you on the 911 Strong podcast. Yeah. So you can find us, um, find my podcast. Um, it's at the underscore 911 strong underscore podcast on Instagram. It's also on YouTube. If you just look up 911 strong. Um, and then my Instagram, which I'm mostly on is dispatcher, Kristen, all one word. Um, I have a Facebook too, but I absolutely suck at Facebook. So you can (laughs) hop on there, but I, like I said, I suck. So here's your warning. Um, but yeah, I do respond to everybody on my Instagram as fast as I possibly can. And, um, yeah, those are the two spots mostly. (laughs) Well, well, thank you so much for coming on again. Like I said, you've been very insightful for me. I think a lot of first responders are going to get a lot out of this conversation. Um, sheepdog nation, make sure that you go and follow it. Kristen, I, I've been following you for years. Um, you do, you, you do talk, you put up great, great posts. Um, your posts are very, you know, it's more than just photos, a lot of good content. Um, and I really appreciate that. Sheepdog Nation. I'll see you next time. They buried me in the ward and I came, I knew. <laughs> Now I'm baptized in blue I'm a fighter, I'm a winner, never quit I refuse to lose I got heart and I got crazy I'm a warrior that's been baptized in blue I'm a warrior that's been baptized in blue I'm a fighter Holy Ghost, I came out with a bad
imagine gun and a heart that said never run I signed up for a job you wouldn't dare to do This ain't no green screen movie, don't compare the two We look at your actions in the elements And everything relevant If they line up, prepare to pay the consequence You do dirt, you get cuffs, no bluff It's ignorant to think we will shoot with your hands up If you the police you feel the world is against you Like every call you go to People trying to tempt you Well, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary I ride on the devil, I ain't scary And I ain't worried You want my life, come take it It's gonna be a fight I take you to the light Like Will and Bright I wouldn't expect you to understand What I do, only the thin blue line Cause they baptized in blue oh, I'm a fighter I'm a winner, never quit I refuse to lose I got hard in blue, I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue, I'm a fighter, number one When I see a name on the wall All I feel is rage Put me in a cage Let me brawl Sometimes I can't help but cry Like why did he die? I know it was him But it could have been I What about the kids? Uh, what about the spouse? Yeah, now who gon' put food Inside them baby's mouth? It's a bigger picture When I officer down Domino effect Blue Nation family Country and town The media don't cover us huh. Well maybe Fox Cause MSNBC and CNN Surely don't care about cops Politicians more concerned About protecting the legal Instead of laying the law down And protecting the people Let me get off my soapbox Before I curse I don't see way too many cops Riding in hearse Well I wouldn't expect you to understand What I do Only the thin blue light Cause they baptized <laughs> In blue, uh. I'm a fighter, I'm a winner, never quit, I refuse to lose, I got hard and I got gritty, I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue, I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue, I'm a fighter, never winner, never quit, I refuse to lose, I got hard and I got gritty, I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue, I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue, uh. if I'm faced with a mission, I'm gonna complete it, if that means being delivered, I live with the credence. I do this for the combat vets and Leos when I'm suited, ready to go. It's either the friend or foe. Only Lord knows what my future's in store. I only kill with the host to see more. So God don't close that door. If I take a life, it's him or me. With the host to survive, not be a good tree. I go in situations that you cannot imagine. Deal with things that you cannot fathom. No, it but so rather. I'd rather fight for a cause than live for nothing. So when you read my head, don't you know I died for something? You hypersensitive, she complain by justified force. You blame the cops first, that don't work, you blame the courts. But I wouldn't expect you to understand what I do, only the thin blue line, cause they baptized in blue. Oh, I'm a fighter, I'm a winner. I never quit, I refuse to lose I got hard and I got gritty I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue I'm a warrior, just been baptized in blue I'm a fighter, number one